Good evening. I'd like to call the March 23rd Board of Education meeting to order and ask that we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, now we have the high school student report, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys. You got it. You should be in there now. Continuing with, uh, with athletics, the hockey team finished up their season, winning the Southern Regional, the Southern Westchester Regional Championship for the first time, which was a big, a big accomplishment for the boys and for Eastchester. Currently, fall two sports are up and running. Girls and boys volleyball have started, as well as the girls swimming team. Cheerleading has continued, and they won their first competition last week, becoming the regional champions. Football also had their first game against Harrison last Saturday, and their next game is this Friday night. Limited tickets are available for spectators, and despite everyone having to wear masks and social, be socially distanced, it is a huge step in giving everyone a little more sense of normalcy during these crazy times. We are, we are looking forward to the spring sports, including baseball, softball, tennis, golf, and lacrosse, that will be starting up in the end of April. Players Club is putting on a live show for their spring musical called the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Audition material is out for students to pick up now, and auditions will be the Wednesday after vacation. With only 15 people being selected for this production, students are eager and excited to try out and be a part of the show. As the honor societies are getting towards the end of the year, they are starting to take applications from underclassmen to be reviewed. The Social Studies Honor Society is taking applications until this Friday and is putting on their middle school history trivia nights in April. The Science Honor Society has started meeting with underclassmen as well. The National Honor Society is continuing to tutor younger students in all subjects. Lastly, the Spanish Honor Society just did a competition in which members recreated paintings from famous Spanish artists using only props they had in their homes. A special shout out and congratulations to Joe Cardellano, who received a National Silver Key from the Scholastic Art Awards for a singular artwork as an AP Studio Art candidate. National awards are the highest level of achievement, making Joe's artwork significantly special. Model Congress attended the Columbia Conference two weeks ago where they virtually competed against many schools. This two-day conference resulted in Eastchester getting a few honorable mentions and many of their bills getting passed, making the conference an overall success. Although that was most likely their last conference of the year, they'll be having officer elections soon. The Going Green Club had a special guest on Friday, Frank DeMarco. He is the superintendent of public works and a part of the Tuckho Environmental Committee. He taught the students about a new food scrap recycling program that everyone's encouraged to get involved in. Also, this past weekend, some students from Going Green attended the Columbia University Youth Summit where they got to learn about climate change through different workshops and guest speakers. 
The Italian club is putting together presentations to celebrate Dante on this Thursday, March 25th. Dante is considered the father of the Italian language and is very important to Italian culture. Students wanting to participate have the option of creating a painting or drawing of Dante, baking something to represent him, or even watching the movie The Inferno. They will get together to show off their creations and what they learned at their meeting this Thursday. Lastly, as we, are, we, as we are moving towards the end of the year, juniors are beginning to get in the swing of the college application process. Guidance counselors are starting to meet with their students to talk about their different interests in colleges. There are also virtual college visits tomorrow for the University of Buffalo and the University of Maryland, which is open to all students that are interested. In the next three weeks, all college decisions will be released and seniors have until May 1st to decide what schools they're going to attend. Thank you for your time, and we hope everyone has a nice, relaxing break. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions for them? All right, well, thank you very much as always. That was very informative. I appreciate it. All right, and now any board committee reports? All right, then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Glass for the superintendent's report. Thank you and good evening. I seem to have been uh, lost the connection to the server, so you won't see me on Zoom until I can get back on, at least I think. Um, I wanted to just to dr uh, draw your attention, really the first big item of the, uh, the report today has to do with the budget. And while Assistant Superintendent Lisa Sanfilippo is getting that you know, lined up, I'll just remind everybody that um, we have some state assessment information that Assistant Superintendent Scott Wynn put out today that was very important about our state assessments in English language arts, math, and science uh, being administered on uh, three dates that were, were shared today on Wednesdays. Um, and we've had a lot of interest, a lot of email on that today. So we are I'm glad to have that information. I know a lot of families have been very interested in knowing that information, so having that out is important. Uh, then there was also some you know, parent-teacher conference dates uh, shifting a little bit as a result of some of that planning and then a new schedule for um, remote uh, hybrid learning schedule coming, coming out. So all of this information is shaping up to get us through the rest of the school year. Uh, and Thursday, a big day for us. This Thursday at 5.30, our, uh, our PTO PTA Council is putting together a funding advocacy um, press conference that will be held right here in front of this high school at 5.30, day after tomorrow. And we encourage everyone to come on out and, and get active and let our legislators and governmental officials know how vitally important it is to fully fund, especially at this critical time, public education. And um, lastly, just want to mention a little bit about surveillance testing. There will be some information coming to families tomorrow, specifically. Some more Q&A and uh, forms to authorize surveillance testing. Uh, I know that families already sent one of those out. and respond We already sent it out and they've responded to it, but this will be a more official and formal um, form that will allow you to give your consent to have your child tested with the Binax test card. If you're interested in doing that, we need as many families uh, to provide consent as possible because it gives us the best, pot, the best, most accurate um, ability to, to run a, an accurate program. Uh, so we have a high level of participation. That high level of participation bodes well for uh, making sure that no student is tested too many times and that we have a good, accurate reading. So we are asking that you take a look at that informed consent. Please consider um, filling that out and responding through a Google form that you will see tomorrow along with more information. OK, those are just some of the preliminary items I have. The, 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 main, the main event here for the superintendent's report is a PowerPoint presentation that uh, we're going to share with you now.
property tax cap calculation. This is a similar slide to what you've seen earlier. Some of the numbers have changed. Um, let me just highlight some of the changes. We recently refunded our um, debt on the middle school um, addition, so that impacts our tax cap um, levy limit. So you'll see that the um, in the 21-22 exemptions, you may not notice it, but the capital tax levy number um, has changed, as has the transfer to capital number has changed. Um, but the bottom line is it's still about a 2.02% increase. So I just wanted to, in case anybody's taking notes on this, those couple of numbers have changed. So um, this slide is regarding the revenues of the actual revenues approved budget for this year, estimated actual revenues for this year, and the estimated revenue budget for, uh, for next year. Uh, we started, we showed this slide last, um, during the last presentation. There's not too much that has changed at the moment. I do just, um, the one, I think one number on the slide that has changed was on the assigned fund balance and transfers down at the bottom here. This number, 298,681, that is the actual number um, that we're gonna use from our reserves before it was just around at $300,000, but I can need to get specific, so that's the number that I put in there. Um, all these other numbers, um, let's say the tax levy and the um, county sales tax, um, I think are pretty, uh, pretty uh, solid right now. Non-resident tuition, I'm working with Noreen, uh, to determine whether there might be some flexibility in that number there. Um, and all the other numbers, with the, of course, the exception of state and federal aid, that number is still tentative at the moment until hopefully April 1st, we'll have a state budget, and then we'll uh, know if there's more funding coming or whether or not. So, um, like I said, this hasn't changed too much from two weeks ago, but it could change significantly in the next two weeks. So I just wanted to give a little overview of our federal stimulus money um, and try to break it down as much as I can um, to make it understandable for everyone. So the first round of um, fe uh, federal stimulus was in the form of the CARES Act funding. That's the first bullet. It's called GEAR ESSER funding. That was um, appropriated to uh, school districts by Congress last March 2020. Our allocation was almost $85,000. Um, we're still waiting to get our application approved by the state. We have resubmitted now a third time to the state, and that's just the application. We haven't even done the, um, the expense report yet, so I really don't know when we're going to see funding on that, when the cash is actually going to flow to us. The next round of funding was the CRRSA, um, some call it the CARES Act II money. That was um, appropriated in December of 2020. That allotment for us was $253 plus thousand dollars, and we've received no guidance on how to apply for it, what we can use it for. Um, none of that has come through to us yet. Um, the third round is the um, legislation that just passed this March. We've seen in the newspaper, nowhere else, that no. our, uh, our allocation is could be $541,000, but we've also been told that it is um, subject to the New York State budget process. So that the final allocations will be determined by the state. They have to follow the guidelines set by the federal government, but we won't know the final allocations until the New York State uh, budget process is completed. In total, that's almost $880,000 worth of federal stimulus money that could potentially flow to us. The downside of this is that we just really don't know the timing on this. We don't know what we're going to be allowed to spend this money on. We don't know the process to which to claim, by which to claim the money, and we don't know when we'll actually see the dollar. So I'm hesitant to use any of this money in this year's budget process because I just don't know that it's something we can count on. Because here we are one year later in the first round, we still don't have it So I just want to put that caveat out there. It doesn't mean future years we won't be able to use it, offset it to, you know, for, for things that we've already spent money on, but we just don't have that. So at this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Glass to uh, go over some of these um, proposed new FTE expenditures um, based upon our meetings with uh, the district administrators. 
Thank you. As you know, the, um, the budget process involves extensive uh, meetings with all the budget line budget owners within the district, who we ask them to go through their programs, take a sort of a zero-based approach. What do you need to accomplish the work, rather than just hearing over a budget from previous years? And we have some in-depth conversations with all of them. We take that information and compile it. We look at the funds we anticipate to be available. We go back again and have more conversation to try as a group to prioritize because it's not unusual that you would have uh, more things that you feel you need than resources available. And so in, um, sorry about that. So in most cases, uh, you know, there's a prioritization process. We are still in that process. Uh, you won't be approving the budget, obviously, tonight. I think that's uh, two more board meetings out. So this is the first uh, the first draft, if you will, of some of the priorities that have emerged based on everything that we know about uh, where we stand as a district, what we've been through with the uh, with COVID to this moment, uh, the social and emotional needs that we keep hearing about. And so I'll just run through these you know, briefly. Um, as you know, we, we uh, lost our supervisor of guidance this year, uh, mid-year. And uh, as a result, you know, we had to make a decision about whether to you know, replace that position or do something else with those funds. And I think our recommendation here is to invest in elementary school counselors, which will give uh, counselors at all three of the elementary buildings, counselors or psychologists, and or psychologists at all three buildings. Uh, so then, um, uh, and we know, and also there's a compliance component that is required to have that. We had, we, when we had our supervisor of guidance, we were in compliance uh, with, with, the rec with the requirement to you know, have guidance services available at the elementary schools. So we have to address that one way or another. Uh, then there's, we know that we need uh, ENL support um, in the early, in the younger grades. Um, that's been something that we've been consistently aware of and, and know about, and we want to continue to provide that support uh, now more than ever. That's going to be important. We also need support at Waverly and AIS. That's been expressed. Uh, so that academic intervention service support is direct service that uh, our youngest students really need. Um, social worker at grade 6-12 is also something that was identified and prioritized as a need. Uh, as you know, that there was a restructuring at the elementary grades uh, this, this, for this year uh, that involved um, you know, some, some computer uh, programming, or not programming, but um, computer lab uh, work being put in. Uh, and, as, and, and it was a, a different configuration of of that work along with media, and we feel that it would be appropriate to try to put some media specialist support you know, back into those elementary schools to round that program out a little bit. Uh, I don't, we've, we have, uh, as you know, 80 or 100 million dollars worth of work that has to be done uh, on these buildings, and um, as we have not advanced any sort of, at this point, have not advanced any sort of uh, referendum to try to address that in, in large part. We've been doing everything we can year by year by year to take, to, to keep the buildings we you know have, put them in the best repair that we possibly can. And we do a lot of that on our own with our own staff. And um, this has been an identified need for an electrician uh, to be able to address many of the needs that we have across the buildings. Um, coming out of the strategic planning, for lack of a better term, that was done in the technology area over the past year, there were some identified needs that came out of that report to try to increase and improve the support for instructional technology throughout the system. So we are looking at, I believe, about six, potentially about six stipends for uh, technology integration specialists help our teachers move down the path that they've been moving down, you know, using technology instructionally. And so um, we think this is going to be a very important component, something that we had more of in years past. 
it was identified as a point of pride in years past. It's something that budgets constrained in recent years that we think it's important if we're going to be able to meet the, the technology vision that we approved a couple months ago, that we're going to need to start to make some investments in the training and in, in these, these positions to help integrate. So these are stipends to help do that. And then we have a number of uh, clerical increases that, you know, to get some of the support work done that we need. You know? So they're not all in one area, they're in various areas. And so we think that it'll be important to keep the workflow moving the way it needs to. So that's just a high level overview. Um, and there are other expenses that we've identified that, you know, go beyond people. Uh, we, we obviously know that, um, and this was something also that came out of the technology um, and the recommendations from, through, from the process we went through that, and, and most of our, all of our principals and, and have really said it's important that we continue to have devices available in some sort of a one-to-one -one configuration. We saw the shift that took place this year when we took the devices we had and we paired them with devices that families could provide. And in total, we were able to have students come to school with a device, at least at the, up, at the grades two and up, very consistently. And what that did is it shifted the kind of instructional model teachers could plan for and be ready for because they knew that the device would be there. So if they created an experience using with that device in mind, they could deliver that experience because that device was there. We know that that's going to be important, and one way to do that would be to invest significantly in the Chromebooks um, and the cards and the licenses. And the, there's a, a whole plan associated with that. It would it would be a little different by grade level, but it would get us well down the road of being able to maintain that sort of a, an instructional approach, which we believe is important. Uh, we have some, uh, you know, last last uh, a year ago, we were going to go out for a safety and security bond. Um, that was all lined up, and we worked with a community group and you know getting our best thinking out there. But then COVID happened, and that has not gone to the voters, and we have elected not to bring it to the voters this spring. But at some point, we have about $125,000 worth of door access upgrades at our elementary schools that need to be made. And so uh, this is important at a very minimal level to make sure that we have, there's some security issues addressed and some safety issues addressed. Um, at the high school, as you know, we meet the occupational uh, education needs of students through the BOCES primarily. We don't have facilities here that would allow us to offer the kinds of programs that you would need to offer. Those would be very specialized facilities that you know we don't have and most schools don't have, so we have to send students to BOCES for those services. Uh, last year, you'll recall, as a school board, we had a, a, a scarcity of um, slots that were available, and, some, and you know, so it was. We had more students who wanted to attend than we had funds to attend, and we had to uh, close opportunities to some of our students. We are, are proposing to, based on what we anticipate the demand to be this year, and it's personalized year to year for the counseling staff and the staff here at the high school have a sense of what they think the need's going to be and then you try to meet it and budget for it. And it may fluctuate a little bit based on the anticipated needs. Based on that anticipated pro projection, we think we're going to need five more spots and we'd like to put that in the budget so it's available. We have a number of renovations interior that are just due and just need to be done. And so putting $200,000 aside for those kind of bathroom renovations, floor tile replacements, and things like that make a lot of sense. And Lisa, I think this would be a time for you to talk about our capital projects, transfer to capital. Okay, so um, so our potential capital projects 
So looking forward to next steps, um, as I mentioned, we are awaiting the New York State budget. It is due April 1st, when we're all on break, hopefully we'll come back to some good news. Um, we will provide additional details regarding the budget and, and plans to um, increase, modify various programs at the upcoming Board of Education meetings. And we will continue to be planning for September and anticipating any new costs that may be, any mandates that might come down from the state that we're going to have to deal with for September that we Budget that we may be unaware of at this time, um, but the clock is ticking. We're adopting a budget in about 30 days, so um, I'm likely we'll get something from helpful from all of you by that point, but um, you never know. So, upcoming Board of Education dates are um, meeting dates are April 6th, April 20th is when we have the budget adoption, and May 11th is the budget. Finally, the budget vote for trustee election will be on Tuesday, May 18th, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the Eastchester Middle School Gymnasium. And um, due to COVID restrictions, we can no longer, uh, for this year, utilize Dark Road uh, as a polling location. So we're only going to have one polling location this year, and it will be at the middle school only. Um, so uh, please, if you have friends and neighbors that are Dark Road, remind them that. Um, they need to come to the middle school this year and do our best to get that for them as well. So, anyone have any questions or comments? I have, I have a couple questions. I'll try. I'll go backwards because it's probably easier. First of all, regarding the Garth Road, um, will they be able to post a placard or something on election day to remind voters who go there anyway uh, that they need to go to the middle school? I, I, I assume we could ask them yeah. to do that. I don't think they would have an objection to that. I, I think, you know, I, I just think that would be a good idea to ensure that people who forget, you know, aren't sort of uh, overly confused. Um, and then the, the because uh, there are people who have been voting there for, you know, 100 years. Uh, <laughs> um, there were some things that I have questions about on, so on the first slide that you showed, uh, or not the first slide, but the slide that you showed the, the million or so in non-capital expenses, where there's like, so that includes 650,000 for Chromebooks, we can't use that as capital, that's not better off shifted into a capital budget? No, um, Chromebooks are, it's technology and you never want to use capital for that because like the life expectancy is just yeah. too short. And the same but, with the bathroom work or whatever that was so, the bottom? So, you know, when we do something, um, you know, when you renovate a few bathrooms, it's usually considered a maintenance project and it comes out of your general fund maintenance. When you do a larger project, that's when it's considered capital. So if you're renovating a whole wing of a building or something, you could put that together as a project and use that as transfer to capital. So 
these types of um, renovations that Ed is recommending, they're, they're smaller maintenance type. They're not really considered capital. We wouldn't put it into a capital project. Does the state set the number? Um, no, sort of I mean, the state judgment? does have some guidelines as to what is considered a repair and maintenance, like a recurring expense versus what's considered a renovation. Gotcha. Um, okay. So, you know, if, if we were going to do all the bathrooms in the district, maybe you would run, put that into a project where you then need an architect and engineer plan specs, all that. Okay, this so is kind of stuff that we could do without all that. Okay, all right, that's helpful. And then I had one last question, which is on the page before that, where you reviewed uh, the, the FTEs we're looking at to uh, add. Those are net numbers. I seem to remember in a previous meeting we discussed some shifts, and I saw some things there that didn't match up with the shifts that we discussed. So I don't know if that's a net number or if that's a, I don't know if I'm making myself clear with what I'm asking. So, so when you're asking, for example, like the 2.0 um, school counselors, right. when you say that's a net number, I meaning we're adding two full time, we're positions. adding two full time. And if yes. there's an ENL person, we're adding one full time, yes. even though there may be shifting around of existing right. positions. Right, psychologists yeah. might shift from buildings or so, but we need to hire 2.0 guidance for right. school counselors. All right. in the news about like um, providing mental health services for these kids after this pandemic here it's going to be needed and I get I totally support that what right now what are the guidance counselors at the elementary school I know dr. Bello is at Greenville but is he only there part-time or so dr. Bello is a psychologist okay so he is I believe he's full-time at in at Greenville I'm sorry uh, there's one that uh, psychologist that split 0.5 and 0.5 between Greenville and Ann Hutch and um, each Ann Hutch and Greenville have one, so they have 1.5 psychologists. So there's no guidance counselors. There are no the there are no department. school counselors at the so elementary. So if we hire these two, would they be at Greenville and Ann Hutch, or would they rotate around Greenville, Ann Hutch, and Waverly? So the plan is to put one school counselor at Waverly, with and they also have an existing psychologist, so they would have one of each at Greenville. It would also be a guidance counselor and a psychologist. And then that part time or that 50 50 split would go full time to Ann Hutch. So Ann Hutch would have two full time psychologists. Okay. So they would each have two. Right. But Waverly and Greenville would be one and one. Um, and, I, I'm, I, and I know like we have a budget, we can only agree to do so many things. But when we like, when I started on the board, the big push was to have this director of guidance because our high schoolers weren't being directed to go to colleges appropriately and then when we got this director of guidance we were so excited because she had marketed East Chester so well. So I just want to know where we stand right here, where are we going to be taking away from one to be helping or is this really going to benefit the district as a whole? Maybe Scott wants to answer that. So, So I think that the, the general belief is that, you know, obviously, like you said, that at this point in time, needs shift, and we've got this real need for some early intervention. And kind of the, the firm belief is that as you provide additional early intervention, you solve some of the issues that would come up along, you know, kind of along the way for the for the upper grade levels. Um, I think, you know, the, the concerns that exist about college the college process and overseeing the college process, those are discussions that we're having that how else can we address those um, so that we can solve kind of both issues at the same time. So it was kind of a trade-off that we needed to make. Is it going to be the most ideal? Probably not, but like you said, there's only so much right. no, so I much money to go I around. So I think, um, you know, at this point, we see this as the, the best solution uh, to trying to address all those problems. On that same subject, I think the slide said that we were adding two guidance counselors, but we are eliminating one administrative position, right? So the net is only one. The net increase yeah, is I, one. And then I, totally I think the slide the, should reflect that. Well, that's I did put that it was offset by the director, but yeah, it but is going to be two. Right. Okay. Two minus one is right. one. Okay. Uh, my second question is. Regarding all the uh, proposed additions to the budget for next year, 
I presume our next discussion, you'll have dollar amounts next to each of those lines so that when we talk about each one, we'll be able to decide which ones we want to do and which ones we might not want to do. So, my, you know, I, I have numbers for all. I just didn't want to get too bogged down in the course. First, first so, course, it's fine. Um, you know, I think, you know, I'll have to have a conversation with Dr. Glass about what the next presentation will look like, but I think I would prefer to focus on what are our needs and n not necessarily base decisions on what the cost is, but right, what the but needs are. Hard, you know, we have to develop the needs too as a board, right. and we need to know what the costs are and no, I, what I, we I want agree, to invest I, in. I don't want to necessarily make a decision because one is less expensive than the other kind. Have we ever done? So, I don't think so. I'm just saying. I don't think so. <laughs> we always weigh the alternatives, but you can't, you know, you can't have an honest discussion unless you know the numbers you're talking about. Right. Okay. Yeah. And along that line, if I may, just you, you should have some more. Revenue information too, perhaps yes. to match that against, right? So then it becomes more important to know how that's balancing. Right. It might be like we did in past years, where we said if we get X, we can do X, Y, and Z. If we get, you know, X plus, you know, an extra amount, you know. So a lot of it may depend on if we actually. I don't even want to say if we can expect the federal money because we probably won't get that anytime next year either. But if they're not supplanting federal aid, and we know there's more of a one-time stream coming or a permanent stream coming, we might be able to do something else. I agree, though. Obviously, we need to know what the numbers are in making some, some final decisions. And hopefully, we would have that by April 1st or close to it. You know, look, if we can get, uh, after all of our advocacy, and we actually get them, if the state says, yes, you can get 60% of the foundation aid, that may solve a lot of these problems. Uh, change some of the discussions that we've been, you know, have have struggled with in the past years, uh, and so we can hope. But yet, until we, I guess we know, we, you know, obviously we're not making final decisions until we have to. <laughs> uh, all right. Anybody else have any questions? Cheryl. Um, yeah, I just want to kind of second. I have a couple of questions, so I'm just trying to. Uh, actually, it's more like a request for a little bit more um, clarity on on the values that are going into the choices with the budget um, the budget request. So I, I have hesitation, I think as I might be hearing hesitation from from my colleague Aaron about the guidance issue um, since we've had, had lots of conversations over the years about the need for um, shoring up support for um, high school students as they get ready to graduate and go on to careers or college. So I would love to be able to, you know, hear any anything you might be able to share with the board about what's been, what's changed or or if needs have shifted, like what, what's been established at the high school, um, maybe under the director of guidance that has um, gained some momentum there. So if there's anything about what's happening at the high school, if there has been any, any change with guidance, that the high school students are getting more support for post-graduation plans? So, I'm not sure that I would quantify it as additional support. Um, you know, I think the work that Kristen did with our counselors in the time that she was here was really bringing them together and moving them forward in terms of expanding their um, kind of knowledge base in terms of colleges that exist, in terms of exposure to different colleges and programs that are out there. Um, I think in the short time that you know she was there, we have moved to more individualized meetings um, that exist. Um, I know that we do um, a multitude of you know really pinpoint focused kind of meetings um, as opposed to, and I think Part of that is due to the pandemic also, um, where counselors are, are naturally meeting more frequently with their students uh, that they're assigned to. Um, you know, obviously there's more oversight that needs to happen at the building level, and I know that both Dr. Bott and Mr. DeMeo are taking a larger role in, you know, working with the counselors and, you know, trying to make sure that you know, the college process is really moving forward. Um, 
Mrs. Riley has come back into the role as kind of a the teacher department chair uh, of that uh, department. Uh, so we do have that level of kind of oversight that has returned. Um, so I think it's going to be it's going to be a continued work in progress without that direct administrative level, uh, sort you know, oversight within the department. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful to hear. So it was also good to hear about more sure. colleges. I'm sorry. No. It was helpful to hear about more colleges coming to college fairs, different trips to different kinds of schools. I know that COVID has changed a lot of that, and hopefully that will pick up as well. Um, I have a couple other questions. I think the quicker one is the tech integration specialist stipends. Are these stipends for teachers? Are the tech integration specialists that you're talking about teachers on our staff? Yes. Um, okay. So that's good. Uh, what about, is there any um, thought in funding um, the, not, not the specialists who are delivering the service, but also the teachers who are participating in training? Or are, you, are these stipends only for the specialists who would be doing the kind of training or support? So these, these would be specifically for um, teachers to work with teachers. Right. Um, but the teachers they're working with, no stipends for them for participating in training? I mean, a lot of that training is offered mm -hmm. during the day, during the school year, so no, there wouldn't okay. be a stipend for that. All right. um, but we do have teachers, I mean, when we did the Google Fellowship, there was right. compensation that went along with that. Right. That's what um, I was thinking. You know, when teachers, you know, do professional work during the summer, right. there is compensation for right. that as well. I think those were the kinds of things I was thinking about, so I was trying to understand when and how this would happen, but this would be all part of the school year next year. Right, so these tech integration specialists would be working with teachers on prep periods, on you know times that they're free. Um, they may even be pushing into classrooms if the teacher is you know has a need for um, somebody to do some pushing support while they're actually working with students. Uh, so it would be mostly mostly during the day. And the last question was about the library media specialist. So um, I remember our discussions uh, last year or the year before um, when there was an opportunity to sort of transition away from library as um, a special in the elementary schools and more toward the technology end. So we split the technology between um, Mr. Rich and Mr. O'Neill at, at the two elementary schools and by all accounts that has been going really well. So my understanding at that time was that there was a feeling that the, um, the the library literacy role was was not as needed. So, have you are you reconfiguring this role? Are you going to be looking for an elementary librarian, or are we thinking more digital media? Um, and why why is there a thought now that this that there's been a loss by not having this position? So I think this is the next iteration of that of that growth process. So I think the, the plan was always, obviously we, we needed at the moment to kind of create that other position. Um, I think now the, the thought is to look toward the future of what that program could be with the inclusion of someone who has the specific skills of a library media specialist. Um, you know, I do not envision going back to a traditional library program. Um, I would be looking for someone to do much more work with teachers in terms of pushing into classes, working with students, working with Anthony and with Dave in order to bolster the, the research skills and, the, um, and enhance the technology program through literacy. Um, you know, we desperately would need somebody who really has the skills to uh, also provide a suitable collection within each building. Um, you know, that's a specialized skill um, to, to read a collection and to really bring in the best books that we possibly can have uh, for our students. Um, so I think it's, it's taking that program and moving it to the next step. Thank you. That, that's all helpful.
can, can I just add to that and ask another question about that? So, but that would just be one position that's going to go to Greenville and Hutchin Waverly and be responsible for pushing into each of the classrooms or establishing a curriculum that's going to be pushed into each of the classrooms. So it's going to be working with teachers. Okay. It would be at this point, I mean, we're asking for one. In my ideal world, I would love to see one in each building, right. um, but I don't think that's going to be, you know, something we can do right now. So there's no librarian. I know the Greenvale librarian retired, but there's not an Ann Hutcher Waverly at all anymore. No, it was one person. Oh, it was one person for all of them. Correct. All right. Anybody else? Those are excellent questions, guys. Thank you. Oh. I just have one more thing. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm really no, no. I, that, that, I thought that was very informative <laughs> question. Thank you. It's not a question. It's just um, in light of everything that's happened in recent days with the shootings, and I feel like the security and facilities have kind of gone by the wayside and were really lulled by our at-home learning. This whole, if we're just going to be able to do security doors in the elementary schools, I think it should be really important until we get the bond passed. For me, that would be a huge priority. Oh, yeah, I have some. Just one, I, want, I did want to say one thing about the doors and the expenditures on the doors because as I recall in the, in the bond, I mean, we are hoping to go back to having a bond at some point when things are more stable. Um, vestibules and doorways were all part of that bond, so I would just want to make sure that the $125,000 or whatever is being um, allocated for that is not something that will then be undone by new construction that is passed by the bond. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, I agree. This is something that we really need to um, keep on, on the front burner. Um, but that raised a red flag for me because I do remember that it was part of the original bond to really look at all the vestibules and entryways at all the schools, but especially the elementary. So just for clarification, um, and Mr. Blum can chime in if, he, if, if I'm going in the wrong direction, but this is for um, a door access system, right? So we're not replacing, that 125,000 is not replacing any doors, right? That's still hopefully work that we can get done with the security bomb. But right now we have one door access system at the high school middle school complex and something different at the elementary schools. So it would be to upgrade what we have at the elementary schools to the same system that we have at the high school and middle school. And no, that would not be undone then by it was something that was originally in the security bond. We're gonna pull that out and hopefully try to get that done at least now. And it won't be undone by any security bond. So you're, you're basically talking about the entry key card system? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And it would also tie into our lockdown system. Because that key card is gonna open every door in the building ultimately is what the hope was. If we pass. If the, the bond, bond goes forward, right now we'll be doing just the main just for doors. The front door tying into the lockdown system. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Any, that's it for the report, right? All right, all right, can, let me just make sure I'm unmuted. All right, I am. All right, uh, Steve, do you want to do five, six, seven, and eight? So uh, be it resolved uh, that the Board of Education approves the minutes for March 9th, 2021 board meeting. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education approves the personnel agenda as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the placements as recommended by the Committee on Preschool Special Education and the Committee on Special Education. Um, be it resolved that the Board of Education makes the following determinations as written for the CEQRA resolution, for the EMS partial roof replacement and gym renovation as written. Um, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the East Chester Union Free Do I have to read this whole thing? No. Okay. Uh, so be it resolved that we add the proposition as, uh, as written below for the authorization to expend the capital reserve funds. 
be it resolved that the Board of, Board of Education hereby approves the following human services contracts as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education approve the Treasurer's report for February 2021 as attached. And be it resolved that the Board of Education approves the tax certiorari settlements for the 2020 to 2021 school year. And be it further resolved that the Board of Education approves the payment of the corresponding tax certiorari judgment from the reserve for tax certiorari if funds are available as attached. All right, thank you. Tara, can I get a second? I second. Uh, any questions or comments? No. Wow. All right, all in favor? All right, and then Erin, can I get you to move 9, 1, 2, and 4? I can't pull up board docs, so I can't. Oh, okay, <laughs> no worries. Cheryl, do you have it? Yes. Can you do 9, 1, 2, and 4 and leave 3 out? We're going to do that one separately. Okay. Peter doesn't want to move his I'm going to let him move it. That's why I'm doing oh, it I'm separately. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I apologize. <laughs> I, I wasn't paying proper attention. It's no, it's fine. Um, so be it resolved that the Board of Education uh, approve the consolidation of ele election districts as attached. Um, be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the district-wide safety and emergency management plan as attached. And be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves a request for the East Chester Union Free School District to use the Westchester County Department of Health's limited service laboratory to test asymptomatic students, faculty, and staff for COVID-19 using Binax Now. And Dave, can I get a second? A second. All right, any questions or comments? All right, all in favor? All right, and then Vito, can you do 9.03? All right, this one's my baby. Uh, I'm going to move that we uh, approve the New York State Public Education Funding Additional Resolution. That's an additional resolution to the one we approved at our last meeting. And I have requested that this particular language come out of that resolution uh, and stand alone. And, and the reason that I had asked for it to stand alone is because while advocacy is great and we should be advocating for everything that was in that other resolution, I don't think we should have to advocate for money that is ours. And this money was voted by Congress and it was authorized to our school district. We shouldn't be advocating for it, we should be demanding it. Okay, so I'm just going to read the resolution the way it is. And whereas federal funds intended to aid schools in the managing pandemic costs in the CARES Act were used to supplant state aid funds in the 2021 school year, whereas the executive budget proposes to use federal coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriations act funds intended for school pandemic expenses to replace 1.35 billion in state aid in the 2021 and 22 school year, whereas the executive budget proposes to fully use our district's CRRSA allocation in lieu of state aid for the 2021-22 school year, therefore be it resolved that the East Chester Union Free District calls on all state legislators to reject the executive budget proposal to fully supplant state aid with CRS, CRRSA Act federal funds already appropriated by the Congress of the United States for the benefit of school districts, as well as any appropriations which may be appropriated in the future. All right, thank you very much. And Aaron, can I get a second? I second. All right, any questions or comments? I just have a comment I'd like sure. to add on this. Sure. And it's an example, it's an analogy, okay? Uh, when the pandemic hit, New York State unemployment, you know, you're to the, I'm sorry, you mean I, I wasn't on? Hold on. I mean, we came through on someone else's, but yeah, I couldn't get you. <laughs> I hope I was heard on that. But it, it here's, here's the analogy. New York State unemployment for an unemployed person is $504 a week. Congress authorized and then extended $300 a week to the unemployed that was paid through New York State. Okay? So an unemployed person in New York State gets $504 from the state and $300 from the federal government. What the state did to us with this School Relief Act was 
analogous to if they had taken an unemployed person and reduced their $504 down to $204, okay? They supplanted the federal allocation with, with what they were deemed to pay. And that's why I'm so passionate about this and I feel so strong about it. The state, and I use this word, you might not agree with the word, but it's my word, has stolen our funds. Now, we, I hope we're going to get it, and I hope everyone understands that, that it's wrong. It's just plain, outright wrong what they've done. So, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Sure, go ahead. And hopefully I'm saying this correctly, but tonight we watched during the budget presentation talking about $800,000 that we can't count on because of exactly this problem. And half of that, or not quite half of that, has already been, you know, and whether you want to call it stolen or not, if you can't trust that that money's coming. Okay. Actually, the difference in, in the 800,000 number is this approximately 330,000 was authorized by Congress to go to the districts through the state. The 500, and Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong here, the 541,000 in the Third CARES Act was authorized by Congress to be sent directly to the school districts, not through the state. When we get that, how we get it, Lisa said we don't know, but it's already been voted on by Congress and will not be going through New York State. So it's, this deals with the $330,000, which is our money, which they're holding. And, and, and ultimately, if, if, if the state determines that they're going to reduce federal aid by that amount, or I'm sorry, state aid by that amount, whether we get that from the state and have to reduce state funding, it's the same shell game that they're playing. And again, whether you want to call it stealing or you want to call it something else, at the end of the day, we've got $800,000 in budget that is due us for, uh, you know, specifically directly related to corona um, that we can't count on. And you can't count on it. It's, you know, the, the, the specific language that you want to call it is not even, you know, so important to me. Not that I'm questioning your use of the word stealing, but, uh, but just to say, you know, even if you don't want to call it stealing, it's, it's, it's a lot of money that it, it, it's just want to make decisions like these hires and these things that we need to do to move forward in our district that's being held up on us. So, and it's ironic that if the state came around and said, we're having difficulties, our revenues are down, we're going to cut state aid 10% or whatever across the board through the entire state to all school districts, we'd have to tighten our belts. But it's just too convenient that the only thing they cut was the money that the federal government gave us. So that's where it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a shell game, but the shells are exposed. We know exactly what they're doing to oh, us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, anybody else? All right, uh, can I get a second? I got a second, I haven't seconded, all in favor? All right. And future meeting dates, April 6th, April 20th, and May 11th, as discussed during the budget presentation. And I'm now going to go to comments from the public. Again, I would just remind anybody that does want to speak, we ask that you try and limit your comments to three minutes. I've never cut anybody off exactly at three minutes, and I have no intention of doing it tonight. Uh, but please, if I do ask you to wrap it up, just please start to do so if you go way over. And anybody here in person from the public that wants to speak? All right, seeing none, I will give the option to those online who have zoomed in so if you do want to speak just please raise your hand and we will give you the opportunity to speak and as dr glass i think used it as the example right you give you, you take it take a deep breath and give everybody a chance to see if anybody wants to jump up and needs to figure out how to do it on their computer so i'll give it a minute or so all righty Seeing none, I will close that section of public comments and comments from any of the members of the Board of Ed. Anybody? Go ahead, Vito. Uh, let me unmute myself here. Uh, just want to remind anybody watching the meeting to uh, come Thursday night to the public meeting in front of the high school. 5.30. 5.30. 
be there. Yep, please come help us advocate so that we get as uh, you know all of the money we're entitled to and as much of it as we can. Uh, maybe we can get the state to not supplant and take the money, whether you call it supplanting, you call it stealing, whatever it is. Maybe we can get them to stop since our uh, state legislature legislators will be there. Uh, but please come help us have a crowd at the rally to advocate for our funds since it's money we're entitled to and our kids definitely.